Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you to the organizers at Ars Electronica for having me as well. I'm really honored to be sharing the stage this week with so many thinkers and artists at the forefront of this new technology revolution that we're in. Today, I want to project into the future that we're building with AI by examining our past and our present. I'll be drawing upon my work as a journalist. I am an engineer by training, but as Frederike mentioned, I began covering the tech industry after a year of participating in it. So I've been reporting on AI for more than five years now, first for MIT Technology Review, then for the Wall Street Journal, and now for The Atlantic. And my work has spanned covering the breadth of the cutting edge research that's coming out of the academic and corporate labs, as well as the societal impacts of this technology. So I've pro profiled people creating the technology, people fighting to change the technology. I've traveled around the world to profile people affected by the technology. So I've, I've really had a front row seat to the development of AI in all corners of the world. And from that position, I'm deeply concerned about the direction that AI is headed in. And to be clear, I'm not anti-AI. I do really believe that this technology has a profound positive potential, but this is not the version of the future that we're going to see if we continue down the current path. What we're seeing today with generative AI is an escalation of a rapid concentration of power into the hands of the few, more than we've ever seen before. And this is happening at the expense of dispossessed communities around the world. And to understand the depth and the scale at which this is happening, I think we need historical metaphors. So I like to call this AI colonialism. And I use the term colonialism not because what we're seeing with the AI industry is just as violent as historical colonialism. It is much more insidious. But it helps us grasp the sheer scale and the vast power chasms at play today. So let's unpack this, starting with what do I mean when I say that there's a profound concentration of power happening? Well, when we look at the history of AI going back to 1956, which is the very first time that the term artificial intelligence was used, there have been two major phase shifts in the advancement of AI capabilities. So the first one was in 2012, and that was when we saw a transition to deep learning. And this is the class of AI systems that we see everywhere today that are designed to learn from our data. The second was with the release of ChatGPT and the transition to generative AI, and that's an even narrower class of deep learning systems that not only learn from our data, but use it to synthesize more data. So it's learning from images to understand the patterns to then synthesize more images. What actually happened at each of these two inflection points? The difference has been the amount of data and compute that's fed into these systems. And compute here is, it's the industry term that refers to the amount of computational power, the horsepower that's being used to develop these AI models. So here's a chart of the data use over time across these three different eras of AI. And I've, I've blocked off era one, two, and three with these gray bars. And you can see that there's been a very steady increase in the amount of data that's being used to train these systems. And this is actually the log scale. This is the linear scale of the same chart. So you can see that in the last two years, there's just been an enormous explosion in the amount of data that's being used to train AI systems that completely dwarfs what came before. And it's the same story with the compute graph. This is how much compute is being used across the three different eras. And again, this is the log scale. And you can already see from the log scale that there's two separate slopes in era one and era two of AI, where there's a, a sharp uptick in the rate of growth for the amount of compute that's being used. And if we just zoom into the second era of AI development, the deep learning era, this is the linear scale. And once again, you see that the last dots in this chart just completely dwarf everything else that's happening. So this is what I mean uh, by there's a rapid concentration of power. This is, this is a different way of looking at it through the lens of open AI's technologies. Um, you can see from the transition from second era to third era, GPT-2 is the dot on the left, and that's the, the dots cor uh, correlate with the size of these models. So GPT-2 came out in 2019. GPT-4, of course, came out recently. So generative AI is the most maximalist version of AI. It is the greediest version. It needs an enormous amount of resources for it to exist. 
And so that means there are only a few companies in the world that have those kinds of resources at their disposal. And the second thing that I said is, this is happening at the expense of dispossessed communities around the world. Why is that? How is that happening? Well, we're in a situation right now where generative AI is so greedy and so resource intensive that we're literally running out of the data on the internet and compute in our world to upkeep its development. So companies have an enormous profit incentive to find more ways to generate the resources that they're looking for to perpetuate the development of generative AI. And how do they actually create more of these resources? Well, what actually is data? Data is people. And to generate more data, companies need to find ways of continuing to extract that data from us. This is what Harvard professor Shoshana Zubov has called surveillance capitalism, which of course existed before AI. But with generative AI, we're talking about an existential need for these companies to continue creating the business models to extract that data from us. That data also needs to be cleaned, it needs to be prepared. So there's a significant amount of labor that goes into that cleaning. So companies not only need to create the business model to extract data from us, they also need to find new sources of labor that are as cheap as possible to annotate and prepare this data for training AI systems. This is what Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri have called ghost work. And again, ghost work has been around before AI, but it has gotten significantly worse now with generative AI. What about compute? Compute is ultimately computer chips, large data centers. And in order to build these computer chips, we are literally drawing down the Earth's resources to create these chips, not to mention the very complex geopolitical dynamics that are now at play, fighting to maintain control of the resources to build these chips. We're also talking about an enormous amount of emissions. Data centers now account for between 2.5 and 3.7% of global emissions. And this is going to get worse. With generative AI, companies like Microsoft, which supports all of OpenAI's development, is putting down the groundwork and building out more data centers than they ever have in the history of their company in order to support generative AI technologies. So if we rewrite our formula, what's actually behind the production of AI. Surveillance capitalism, labor exploitation, resource extraction, climate change, and what is AI but actually wealth, control, and power? And the important question here is who actually gets surveilled? Who gets exploited? Whose resources are extracted? And who bears the disproportionate brunt of something like climate change? And at the end of the day, who ends up getting the wealth, the control, and the power? Without fail, we're seeing Global North companies disproportionately going to the Global South for these kinds of resources, and the Global South also bearing the brunt of the consequences like climate change. So this is why I call it AI colonialism. AI colonialism ultimately isn't just a metaphor for understanding the dynamics at play now, it's also a way to connect these dynamics to the past. It's the very same communities and countries that were exploited and dispossessed during historical colonialism that are now being exploited and dispossessed by AI colonialism. Once again, there's a wonderful existing scholarship that looks at this phenomenon, and I would highly recommend this paper called Decolonial AI, and also the book, The Costs of Connection, which were really hugely influential for me. So what does this look like on the ground? I'll just hone into one slice of this, the labor exploitation. And I want to share with you the story of this woman, Oscarina Fuentes Anaya, who I had the fortune of meeting in 2021. Oscarina is Venezuelan. She actually studied to be an engineer in university, but life had other plans for her. Venezuela has, in the last few years, experienced the worst peacetime economic crisis in decades. This is a chart of the hyperinflation of their currency with a peak at around 65,000% between the years of 2016 and 2020. And I've seen some accounts that place this number much higher. Unemployment in the country hit 40%. Millions of Venezuelans were suddenly desperate to work for their survival. And by freak coincidence, this was exactly the same time when the self-driving car industry took off. So in 2016, old school auto giants like Volkswagen and BMW started feeling threatened by the Teslas and Ubers of the world 
So they started investing billions of dollars into self-driving cars themselves, and that supercharged the pursuit of commercially viable autonomous vehicles, which meant that they needed an enormous amount of training data to build their self-driving cars, and they needed an enormous base of labor of the people to label that data. So beginning in 2016, Venezuela became one of the number one sources of data annotation for the AI industry. The population is well-educated, it has good connection to Wi-Fi, and all of a sudden, at that same moment, they were willing to work for absolutely abysmal prices. So hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans started doing data annotation work. So Oscarina was still in university when she became one of these people. She was continuing her studies, completing her master's in engineering, but like everyone else around her, she was feeling squeezed by the economic anxiety and just decided to start data annotation work as a backup plan. And she was actually, if you could call it that, one of the lucky ones in Venezuela in that she's a dual citizen in Colombia. And she is a dual citizen because her parents are Colombian, but they fled Colombia a generation earlier from a different crisis to Venezuela. And as the economic devastation got worse in Venezuela, the family then fled back from Venezuela to Colombia. And they ended up an hour south of Medellin in a department uh, called Caldas. And this is actually why I was even able to meet her. This is Caldas nestled in the mountains of Colombia. And this is where I went to visit her. And she became the first person to show me close up what her life was really like working for the data annotation industry. The thing is, Oscarina originally moved to Caldas because she wanted a different life for herself. She was planning to find a new job unrelated to data annotation. And for the first six months, she did exactly that. She got a job at a call center. She was doing really well. And then one day, she ended up in the hospital with debilitating pain and a sudden loss of vision. And the doctor diagnosed her with severe diabetes, which was exacerbated because of delayed health care. And her diagnosis meant that she had to take medication multiple times a day and could no longer leave her home for long periods of time. So that meant she could no longer do her job at the call center because she couldn't do the commute and stay at the office. So that's how she ended up returning back to data labeling. And she worked for a data labeling platform. So these are companies that act kind of like the Uber for data. Tech giants will post jobs on data labeling platforms with a certain price attached to it. And in theory, workers around the world have a choice of claiming the, the task if they're willing to do that work for that price. But when you have very little work and too many workers, which is universally what happens with all of these data labeling platforms, workers are willing to work for any price. And tech giants will pay smaller and smaller and smaller amounts of money as the time goes on. The workers are also pitted against each other to do the work. Only the workers who claim a task first when it appears will have a chance to complete it for payment. So this meant that Oscarina was literally day in and day out tethered to her laptop, waiting for tasks to arrive at any moment. She actually was too afraid to go for walks outside during the week. She eventually figured out that during the weekend, that was less likely for tasks to appear. But there was an experience she had when she was out for a walk on a weekday one day, and a task arrived that was actually quite high paying. She missed the opportunity and then didn't have another task for many weeks. She also had this uh, extension that she, browser extension that she downloaded, which sounded an alarm every time a task appeared. So she would turn it on extra loud while she was sleeping in case a task arrived in the middle of the night so that it would wake her up and she would still have the opportunity to claim the task. So by the time I visited her, she was waiting as long as three or four weeks for a single task to arrive. And she was earning less than $10 across that period of time. Not even, enough time, not even enough money to buy groceries. Of course, it wasn't like that in the beginning. In the beginning, she could make $300 a week. But the more people that fell into crisis, the more workers that came onto the platform, the less opportunities she saw. But she continued to believe in that promise of the $300 a week, which led her to continue working on this platform instead of looking for alternatives. Oscarina's situation is painfully common. I've spoken with dozens of workers around the world 
who it's, it's like deja vu hearing their experiences over and over and over again. They're almost always in the global south. They, these countries have underdeveloped economies, weaker political institutions, so the labor is cheap and there are very few labor laws. And as a result, the workers are paid pennies for their work, work that is actually the lifeblood of the AI industry in the global north. And these companies make billions in profit from this work. And by the way, these workers don't actually see benefit from the technologies they're developing. Self-driving cars are not coming to Venezuela anytime soon. So you can see how this is a reflection of and an extension of colonialism. These countries are underdeveloped precisely because their resources were taken and their labor exploited for centuries to serve other empires instead of their own development. And many times their political institutions were designed by the empire in service of the empire. So now we're seeing the same pattern entrench itself with the AI industry. So this was pre-generative AI. I'm, I met Oscarina before ChatGPT arrived. Generative AI has now made things a lot worse. We need more labor than ever to support these technologies and that compounds the economic incentive for companies to pay workers less and less. So in May, I ended up going to Kenya this time to see how the work has changed in the generative AI era. Kenya is now taking over from Venezuela as the major hub for the data annotation industry, in part because of one key advantage. They speak English because of British colonization, but it's the same story. They're economically underdeveloped. They were in crisis when the work arrived because of the pandemic. There was massive unemployment. They have a highly educated population and good Wi-Fi and desperate workers. This is a, a photo, these are photos from some of the neighborhoods that I went to where the workers were doing this kind of work. I mean, it's just incredibly poor. You see they're using tin to build their homes. And it was the same story, workers tethered to their computers, waiting weeks or months for tasks, and all of this as a means to support their family. This is the thing that they do to try and put food on the table. The other thing that I learned, the nature of the labor is changing. We're no longer talking about self-driving cars, we're talking about chatbots and image generators, which not only need to be trained, they also need to be content moderated. So the work that they're doing is sometimes very akin to what Facebook content moderators did. So there was a story in Time Magazine that broke this scoop in January by Billy Perigo about OpenAI hiring workers in Kenya to make ChatGPT less toxic for less than $2 per hour. And what these workers were doing, they were reading hundreds of text passages a day, describing horrifying scenarios and labeling them in detail, is this sexual content? What kind of sexual content? Does it involve minors? So that it could be delivered to OpenAI and OpenAI could use it to develop an automated filter system that made sure that ChatGPT would never spit this out to users. So I ended up going to meet these workers while I was in Kenya as well, and I want to play for you, in their own words, what this experience was like. This is Alex Cairo. He's 28 years old, and he was on the violent content team for OpenAI, which meant that he was reading and labeling scenarios like murders, stabbings, and self-harm. So when you would go home at night, like what, what would you think about after eight hours of reading all of that, that stuff? Oh, my mental state was was very bad. I had nightmares. I had uh, I feared people. Maybe I, I see too many people coming. I see violence. If I see someone holding a fork or a razor blade, I see people cutting himself or something like that. At night, I will dream. I will have nightmares. Even I I'll tell my brother, okay, just come here, sit with me, like for five hours before I go to sleep because I need someone to talk to before I go to sleep because if I go to sleep, I'll start screaming or something like that. So many things are uh, going a lot in my mind, yeah. yeah. So I met um, Alex about a year and a half after he finished doing the work and he said that he still, his personality had completely changed. He still felt very anxious, isolated from his family. Um, and he was unable to find other work after leaving this opportunity. 
I also learned from the workers that it's not just individuals that are affected, there are entire communities that are affected because when one person is affected in that way, the people that depend on them also get affected. So this is Mofat. He's also 28 years old. He was on the sexual content team for OpenAI, and he spent time reading things about kids being raped by their parents. And after doing this day in and day out for eight hours a day, he would go home and just completely withdraw inside himself. He didn't want to talk to his wife. He didn't want to talk to his stepdaughter. And after months and months, his wife had no idea what was going on because he didn't want to tell her, he didn't know how to explain that his job was somehow labeling sex content for eight hours a day. So after a few months, while she was pregnant, she decided to leave him and took the stepdaughter with her. There are many more dimensions to this story. As I mentioned, this is only one slice of it, the labor exploitation. And across all of these other dimensions, this is a series I did for MIT Technology Review looking at other dimensions, we see the same patterns. It's the global north and the global south in this kind of vast power chasm. So how do we exit out of this colonial spiral? At least when it comes to labor, we're starting to see some beginnings of a way forward. We're actually right now seeing a remarkable moment in Kenya where the workers that are doing this kind of AI work are collectively organizing. This is a photo of some of them protesting in front of a Kenyan court. And they're demanding stronger labor rights from their legislators. What the workers taught me, and this is important, it's not that they don't want to do this work. It's that they want to be compensated fairly. They want protections from psychological trauma. They want these jobs to be careers, actual meaningful forms of employment. And not only that, they also want to have a seat at the table in building AI. They're being asked to do all this work, but they're not being given a voice to express how they feel about the technologies that they're taking a central role in developing. OpenAI frames its technology as beneficial for everyone, and it started recently this process that it's calling democratic inputs to AI, where it's casting a wide net, um, trying to get opinions from everyone on how to actually continue developing its technology, it could be asking and empowering the thousands of workers around the world that it already hires to give them that feedback. These workers have opinions and perspectives that we really need to be paying attention to. And this is not enough. It's not just Kenya or the global south that needs labor loss. The global north needs to impose its own regulation on these companies. And I think Europe has a really important role to play in this. I am American, I can say with 200% confidence we are not going to see the US take a lead in regulation, but, the, but Europe can continue to lead in regulation and particularly in AI labor regulation in the same way that it's leading in data privacy regulation by requiring the companies who sell their products to the European market to comply to certain types of labor standards. And we've already seen this in certain industries like in the fashion industry. Fortunately, we already have some frameworks for the kinds of labor standards that should be used. These are the Fair Work Principles, which is developed by the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, and they interviewed many, many workers, gig workers, digital workers, not just in the AI industry, all around the world to talk to them about their conditions and essentially what kinds of environments and what kinds of power dynamics lead them to be exploited. And they laid out a framework for things that we should be bare minimum guaranteeing for these workers, such as they should know who they're working for. Oscarina, Mofat, Alex, none of them knew the companies that they were working for. It, Mofat and Alex didn't even learn that they worked for OpenAI until it was leaked to them. So they have no opportunity to contest to whatever power, whatever authority that is dictating the things that they're doing to tell them that it's not things that they want to be doing or should be doing. So interestingly, these uh, fair work principles are actually quite similar also to what Oscarina told me when I asked her what she wanted, she told me, I hope that in four to five years, Appen can become a traditional employer. Appen was the platform she worked on. They know we exist, they know that we can get sick, and that we need security and healthcare. These are basic human rights that she's asking for. So we need to listen to people like Oscarina, the most vulnerable in society, if we actually have any hope of making truly beneficial AI systems for everyone. 
So I wanted to just end with one other thing that Oscarina told me. She, um, when I went to visit her, she asked her uncle to take a photo of us while the sun was setting, and she sent it to me a few weeks later and said, please don't forget us. Thank you so much. Thank you.